tonight on KQED Newsroom with a new Democratic majority in the House. What lies ahead for the Russia investigation? We'll talk with Congressman Adam Schiff, the expected incoming chair of the House Intelligence Committee. And in Butte County, firefighters are still battling the deadliest wildfire in state history. A look at what's being described as the new abnormal and how future fires can be prevented. Plus, pioneering leader and former San Francisco Mayor George Moscone. On the 40th anniversary of his death, a new documentary honors his life and legacy. Hello and welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Tui Vu. We begin with political investigations and standoffs. After months of negotiations, President Trump today said he has prepared his written answers to questions from special counsel Robert Mueller in his Russia probe. This comes as a bipartisan bill to protect Mueller from being fired is the subject of a standoff in the Senate. Meanwhile, Democrats are intensifying their demands for acting Attorney General Matthew Whitaker to recuse himself from overseeing Mueller's Russia probe. In a Washington Post op-ed this week, California Congressman Adam Schiff wrote that if Whitaker tried to obstruct the investigation, quote, he will be called to answer, his actions will be exposed. Schiff is in line to become chair of the House Intelligence Committee in January. He joins me now via Skype from Washington, D.C. to talk about this and other political developments. Congressman Schiff, nice to have you back. Thank you. Good to be with you. First off, just want to ask you about the news conference that President Trump held today. He said he has prepared his answers to special counsel Robert Mueller's questions. Uh, what's your reaction to that? Well, honestly, I think what is really called for here is an in-person interview. Uh, these may be some of the questions that can be responded to in writing, but when you get questions answered in writing from a witness, uh, it's really more the lawyer testimony than the witness testimony. Uh, and particularly on an issue of obstruction of justice, which I think was not part of the subject matter of these questions, and where the president's intent uh, is so important, uh, whether he had a corrupt intent, as he said about the firing of James Comey, that he wanted to uh, influence the Russia investigation, you need to be able to ask those questions, and you need to be able to ask the follow-up questions in real time, which you can't do in writing. So I hope that uh, Bob Mueller will persist uh, and make sure that he gets the answers that he needs, and he gets the answers in person. All right. I want to also ask you about something else that uh, is coming out in news reports today, and that has to do with the Justice Department. Apparently, uh, has secretly filed or will file criminal charges against WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. Uh, WikiLeaks published thousands of emails that were stolen from Democrats. The information was also used by Russian intelligence officials in the 2016 presidential election here in this country. How do you think this will affect? Uh, special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation into election uh, interference by the Russians? You know, it's hard to say uh, because we don't know the nature of these charges. We don't know uh, if the report is accurate. Whether that indictment, though, involves uh, the WikiLeaks actions, his actions in pushing out the Russian stolen information, uh, or whether it involves uh, the prior information that WikiLeaks put out or other information WikiLeaks put out uh, that was... Um, reported to be property of the intelligence community, it's hard to evaluate. Um, but uh, I will say this, I don't think Assange is a reporter. Uh, and certainly, uh, if you look at some of his conduct during the pushing out of these stolen emails and communications with people associated with the Trump campaign, he wasn't acting like a journalist. He was acting like a partisan, someone who wanted to help bring about one outcome. And of course, the effect of what he did was very much designed to bring about one outcome and to tear down uh, and harm the Clinton campaign. Also regarding the Justice Department, it issued a legal opinion this week uh, that Matthew Whitaker's appointment as acting attorney general is valid. Uh, it said other presidents in the past have installed uh, officials as temporary cabinet members without Senate approval. You disagree with that. Why? There is a succession statute that is directly in place designed for exactly this contingency when someone at the top levels of the Justice Department is fired, the Attorney General is fired or pushed out. We have a statute that's very much on point. And so what the Justice Department is doing here is they're relying on a very general statute. Uh, and when there's a conflict between something that is specifically on point and a general statute, the specific statute wins. Uh, and what's more, when the plain language of the Constitution is involved, as it is here, uh, and it says that you must be Senate confirmed if you are a principal officer, and clearly the attorney general is a principal officer, then the clear language of the Constitution applies. 
You and other Democrats have uh, said Mr. Whitaker should recuse himself from the Russia investigation. What are you worried will happen if he does not step away from that investigation? This is the ethics question. I mean, this is someone who auditioned for a role in the Justice Department. Uh, avowedly, this is something he acknowledged by going on TV and basically slamming the Mueller investigation, talking about how you could cripple it if you were in charge of it. My fears about it are that he will fall through with what he proposed uh, when he was talking about this on TV. And that is take actions outside the public view to scuttle Bob Mueller's work. Um, he could also serve as a back channel to the president to provide confidential case-specific information to Donald Trump or his lawyers about the investigation. Um, if Bob Mueller produces a report for Congress or the American people, uh, he could try to bury that report in the Justice Department. So there's any number of actions he could take that would be inimical to the interests of justice. Now that Democrats have taken control of the House, you will become the chair. You're set to become chair of the House Intelligence Committee in January. What steps sure. will you take regarding the Russia probe? We're going to be looking at the work that we were able to do uh, previously in the minority, the uh, avenues of investigation that the public can shut down because they were too concerned that it might lead to incriminating information. Uh, one of the issues in particular that I think uh, needs to be investigated that the Republicans would not allow us to look into is whether the Russians were laundering money through the Trump Organization and the Russians, uh, whether the Russians have financial leverage over the President of the United States that might explain the otherwise inexplicable conduct at, in Helsinki or uh, more generally uh, the President's pro-Russia policies. Uh, so there are uh, any number of investigative threads we were not allowed to pursue and we're going to have to put the most important uh, matters first. Let's turn to Republican Congressman Kevin McCarthy, newly elected as House Minority Leader. He's a fellow Californian. He's from the Central Valley. How do you plan to work with him? Well, look, this could be a good opportunity for California, an opportunity in which the Speaker of the House, and Nancy Pelosi, is from California, and the Republican Minority Leader is from California. I'm not sure that we've had that circumstance uh, for any state in the past. And not to mean that with issues that are deeply important to Californians, we are in a driver's seat. Uh, so uh, when we have the president of the United States threatening to withhold funding to fight wildfires in the middle of the worst wildfire disaster uh, in our state's history, uh, the Congress will be well positioned to push back and make sure the state gets the resources it needs to meet this uh, this uh, state uh, disaster. But do you think uh, Kevin but McCarthy? Broadly, but do you think Kevin McCarthy will work that closely with you on issues like that? Because in the past, President Trump has called him my Kevin. They've been closely allied in the past. Well, listen. I hope so. It, it will depend on whether he puts the interests of California and his constituents uh, above the the often uh, ravings of the President of the United States, uh, even during tragedy, as we saw with the fires. Uh, so, yes, uh, there will be times where, uh, because the president and his interests are so ant antithetical to ours in California, that Mr. McCarthy will be in a difficult position. To give you another, the president wants to drill off our coast. Uh, Californians do not want that to happen. Uh, so what is the minority leader going to do? I would hope that he will side with California and his constituents on that and many other issues important to our state. All right. Congressman Adam Schiff joining us via Skype from Washington, D.C. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We turn our attention now to California's deadly wildfires. As of this morning, the Butte County campfire has incinerated almost 10,000 homes. It destroyed the mountain community of Paradise. More than 60 people have died in the blaze. Many were still in their homes as the flames raced into town. More than 600 people remain missing. The campfire is the most destructive in state history and follows a series of increasingly ferocious fires from the North Bay fires last fall to the fire tornado in Redding this past summer. Summer. Emergency responders, public health experts, and land use planners are scrambling to cope with what Governor Jerry Brown is calling the new abnormal. And unfortunately, the best science is telling us that uh, dryness, uh, warmth, uh, drought, all those things, uh, they're going to intensify. Pacific Gas and Electric is once again facing questions about whether its power lines might have sparked the fire. President Trump plans to visit Butte County tomorrow. And here now with more on all of this are KQED Morning News Editor Ted Goldberg and KQED Politics and Government Reporter Marisa Lagos. Welcome to you both. Thanks for having Thank us. You.
Well, Ted, there have been so many lives lost, so many homes destroyed, and, and I think one of the things that people want to know is what caused this? I know that you uh, broke the story about one possible origin for the fire, possibly connected to PG&E, and now investigators say there's a second possible cause. Can you bring us up to date on all that? So the first clue came on Thursday afternoon when PG&E filed an incident report with the California Public Utilities Commission and basically said on this major transmission line in the area of Polga, one of these small resort towns in Butte County, there was an outage and that outage took place a few minutes before the fire started. And then, like you just said, last night, Cal Fire announced that there might be a potential second origin of the fire. It's unclear if that second spot, which is on Concow Road, which, you know, if you've been following the coverage, that name comes up a lot because uh, people living there were, were pushed out and, and hurt. But also, um, it's unclear to me if that was a new fire that started there or if that was somehow there were spot fires you know that were expanding from the major fire so far in advance that that was actually just a new spot fire and cal fire has not clarified that they've emphasized the cause of the uh of the fire is still under investigation mm -hmm. these are just clues at this point but meanwhile uh, the head of the california public utilities commission michael picker is now saying he'll expand an existing probe into pg and e's corporate structure its safety practices but at the same time he also says he doesn't want the company to declare bankruptcy. He wants to see it stay financially solvent. So Marisa, what does this all mean? Will PG&E be allowed to exist in its current form? I, I think that's going to take months, maybe years, to really untangle. I mean, this has sort of been a roller coaster of a week for PG&E when it comes to the stock market. We saw their shares basically get cut in half um, since before the fire, up until midweek, and then plummet on Thursday uh, even further. Then Michael Picker, the head of the CPUC, made a comment on a call to investors where he basically said, you know, on this private call, we don't want PG&E to go bankrupt. He followed it up with that public statement about looking at their structure. Um, I think that this speaks to the real seriousness of this situation, that you have regulators actually even voicing this idea that we should assess sort of, you know, the heart of the company. Um, and I think that what, what ultimately Picker's trying to do is shore up pg &E. Nobody wants to see them go bankrupt. I think even the harshest critics do not want that to happen. That would put everything in front of a bankruptcy judge. Um, but is there a, an inherent conflict of interest, though, right? Is an investor-owned utility. So then do you run the risk of having investors who are more focused on the bottom line than on safety? How do you resolve that? Well, I mean, that's been really a uh, tension there since 2011. Um, 11, 10, when uh, the neighborhood in San Bruno blew up, uh, PG&E gas line was at fault, and then we've seen this again. They were blamed for 16 fires in 2017. Um, I think that that is a question that critics have been asking for a while. Um, I think it's, you know, this is really unprecedented territory. I was, talk I was talking to Wall Street analysts about that. They've never seen anything mm. like this. PG&E has been in existence for over 120 years. Um, they've always been a private company. But I think you're right. I mean, I think, you know, we get our water in California in most cases from public utilities. This sort of hybrid of a Wall Street traded company mm -hmm. with its shareholders um, and cu customers who ultimately, you know, have borne a lot of the cost of these things does it. It is an inherent conflict. And, and, and while all of this is going on, all of this is unfolding, uh, some residents in Butte County already think they know who's to blame. They've already filed a lawsuit against PG&E. What are the grounds for their, their complaints in that suit? So they're accusing PG&E of negligence. They've said that, and they actually uh, have focused on the fact that they believe that PG&E has done a bad job of, of maintenance and making sure that their, uh, their structures are safe and sound. And to your point about whether or not it's appropriate to have you know, a profit-driven company in charge of utilities, State Senator Jerry Hill has told KQED that he's looking into the possibility of legislation that would either break up the company or turn it public so the, I think the San Bruno explosion happened in Jerry Hills district. indeed yeah and I think you know it's a very similar lawsuit to what we saw with the 2017 fires it's important to note we still don't know if they're responsible for the Tubbs fire which was the biggest and deadliest in 2017 mm -hmm. their valuation has plummeted to around 13 billion dollars that's far less than any one of these fires probably caused damage of. So it really is an open question. And and Ted, um, so we have the fire is obviously still burning. What are the resources the state is bringing to bear on all of this and trying to put the fire out? Well, we've heard this story several different times in the last few years where California brings in a huge amount of resources. Not only are there thousands of Cal Fire firefighters, but they bring in firefighters from the U.S. Forest Service, inmate firefighters from the state uh, correct 
Corrections Department. There are about 1,400 inmates who are helping the fires, uh, helping battle the fires. There's also uh, uh, resources from out of state. So this is this situation where you have thousands upon thousands of people, you know, fighting these these fires, not just here, but obviously the the, the big Woolsey fire down in Southern California. And then who knows? We could expect to have another big fire. If you remember last year, the Thomas fire took place in the winter. Right. Any idea on when this fire will be contained? Well, right now they're saying it's 45 percent contained, and the estimated time that it should be fully contained is at the end of the month. But those kind of mm -hmm. dates, I notice, change from time right. to time. Yeah. And sometimes full containment, you know, is important, but it's not. It, you know, the question is, are homes threatened? Where is right. the fire burning? And and what about air quality? Right, we are Good seeing God. it all over the Bay Area. Scores of uh, schools are closed today. There are new reports out on on just how bad it is. I mean, it's ranking right up there with the worst pollution levels in the world, Ted. I mean, I was looking at the Bay Area Air Quality Management District on their site. They have sort of classifications for how bad the air is. And there's actually one near our station on Arkansas uh, Avenue in Petro Hill. And that is one of the highest in the region. You'll see that the air quality in places like Vallejo and San Pablo are reaching into hazardous levels. They haven't reached that yet, but we have never experienced anything like this. I'm not, you know, I, I'm, we're seeing people with masks every where you go, uh, there are home the, uh, in in San Francisco and Oakland. We know that the city is trying to reach out and, and provide masks to people on the street, but there's only so much you can do. I'm actually surprised. We've talked to county health officials, and there's just not a huge number of people entering the ERs. They're they're seeing a slight uptick, but not a huge. Any amount. estimate on when uh, the the air levels will be will get better? So right now we're expecting the possibility of rain by midweek uh, next week. It's possible that this smoke could get pushed out by Wednesday. But I remember speaking to a national weather service meteorologists earlier this week and they said oh it'll just be the next following day these kind of things do get extended so I think these are just predictions at this it's point fluctuating let's talk Marisa all about who's going to pay for the damage from all these fires right well you have this horrible human toll people so many people lost their homes so many lost their lives um, earlier this year Governor Brown signed a, a law that protects utilities from bearing full liability costs for wildfires that may have been caused by their equipment and, and allows a company like PG&E to go ahead and issue bonds and then pass on those liability costs to ratepayers. That law applies to 2017 fires. It does, it does not apply to 2018. What does this mean for these fires and future fires? I mean, again, I think it's unclear, and I think that when the legislature convenes in January and the new governor is sworn in, we'll see a better picture emerge of what they plan to do. Um, Michael Picker, the head of the CPUC, did indicate that he thinks maybe cleanup legislation could extend that bonding capacity to 2018. We'll have to see if there's a political appetite for that. But that I feels mean, like a bailout, right? Well, and I think that's what critics will say, and I think that gets back to our earlier conversation about what is the future of this utility more broadly, they cannot afford the cost if you factor in not just this fire, but last year, maybe even this fire alone they can't. I mean, they say they have insurance up to $1.4 billion through next July. That's a fraction of what we're estimating the destruction is here. You know, we haven't even talked about the housing crisis and what are these people going to do in a place where there are not other options the way there were in Sonoma and Napa counties for people who are displaced. And you know, aside from the the enormous economic toll we're talking about, there's the an, an environmental dilemma here. I mean, if you have a company like PG&E and it starts being strapped for cash, its stock market price val uh, plummets. It's only it's worth about nine billion dollars now, uh, uh, way way less than it was before. If, if they are struggling for finances, how will they? help California's goals of the renewable energy and, and continuing vegetation right. management. How does that happen? Well, I think that's the key question. And, and, you know, I think that there's kind of two issues here, which is this, this question of have they been, you know, done a good job of upkeeping their equipment and then the bigger question of the climate change issues. Um, I think that lawmakers are going to have to weigh that. Regulators will have to weigh that as well. All right, KQD's Marisa Lagos and Ted Goldberg, thanks to you both. Thank pleasure. you. Now a look at the legacy of a former San Francisco mayor viewed by many as a champion of the people, George Moscone. He was an early proponent of gay rights and worked to create a city government that reflected San Francisco's diversity. Forty years ago this month, Moscone was shot and killed in City Hall by former supervisor Dan White. Now Moscone's life and leadership are the subject of a new documentary, Moscone, A Legacy of Change. Here's a clip from the film. As the first truly modern mayor of San Francisco, he pushed and inspired city government to become more inclusive, diverse, and tolerant. His life was cut short by the assassin who also murdered 
gay activist Harvey Milk. The darkest day in San Francisco's political history. But like Milk, Moscone left a legacy that has endured. And joining me now to talk about the documentary is producer and director Nat Katzman and George Moscone's son, Jonathan Moscone, who is featured in the film. Nice to have both of you here with us. Thank you for having us. Jonathan, over the years, a lot has been written and said about that very awful dark time in 1978 when uh, Dan White shot and killed your father along with Harvey Milk. This film covers those events really through the lens of your father's life. Why was that so important to you? Well, it, it, we know how the story ends, and the story uh, has been so usurped by the ending. And what made my dad so powerful was not just uh, his mark in history as someone who died for what he believed in, but someone who, from a childhood of no privilege whatsoever, made it, pos made it through the system and changed a lot of it and had a lasting, lasting effect, including his relationship with Harvey Milk, who was an amazing man himself and whose story hasn't been eclipsed um, because of the great movie Milk. And uh, so we needed, we needed to tell George's story. And uh, like you said, Harvey Milk, uh, an icon, was the first uh, openly gay elected official in California. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that, that his iconic status sort of overshadowed your father's legacy? I think unintentionally it did because the gay community at the time, the LGBTQ community at the time, and still does, needs heroes and needs someone to to push their their uh, their identity and voice forward. And so that became a really urgent call to action. Um, but that in, unintentionally left my dad's story sort of over to the side. And uh, so a lot of friends and families really got together of my dad, led by my brother Christopher, to really to, to change that and bring my dad's story back to the center. And that he used the word hero. Harvey Milk was a hero to many, but mm -hmm. Moscone was a hero to many. He really, he really he worked was. hard to like make sure he, he was inclusive in the way he built city government in San Francisco. He was a state senator before he became mayor. Can you talk about his role as a trailblazer? What set him apart from other politicians of that era? Well, several things did him. And as you said, he had two functions in politics. He was a state senator for a long time and a mayor for just short of three years. Uh, as a senator, his role was in passing legislation, very progressive legislation and a lot of it. And that's an important part of his legacy that we San Franciscans sometimes overlook because he was the mayor, and when you see yeah. the mayor, that's an executive who runs the place. Well, as senator, he supported bilingual education. He supported California school lunch program. He o helped to overturn the state sodomy statute. He did a lot of important things. And he also did a lot of things. When one of our interns made a reference to this. She was, she was doing research on the legislation that George Moscone had a hand in passing. And she was taken by something about mattress safety. Mm. But it was an early bit of consumer protectionism. And it's just part of a long list of things that he was involved in in Sacramento during his career. But I'd also add that when he became mayor, it was like a switch was turned. And in the city, the, the halls of power in the city had previously been white men. And within months of Mayor Moscone being inaugurated, power was distributed among people of all sorts, women, minorities, gays, everything that reflected the, the diversity of the city of San Francisco. And it happened so quickly yeah. that that's what impressed me a lot. When and, and Jonathan, where do you think that framework for your father's beliefs in inclusiveness, diversity came from? You know, that's a good question. I don't know. Uh, I have a very imaginative uh, mind to, <laughs> to guess at what happened. He was uh, raised by a single woman, and I think he even talked about how his mother uh, really struggled very hard to make it and to be respected for the work that she did, to be paid for the work that she did. He grew up on the streets. He was a basketball player, so he knew the neighborhoods all across the city and was a great level playing field, the basketball court. And I think his father was a prison guard at San Quentin, and I think he just saw the world. And he was, like sometimes people wonder, how did Shakespeare write everything? 
He was a creative person who saw the world and saw that he could change it. And he had a capacity to talk to people across the aisle, across the street, and across the political spectrum, and get them to really listen to what he had to say. He had power, and he built his privilege, and he used it for good. As his son, when you watch this film, what surprised you the most? There was a picture of us in Hawaii that surprised all of us because we forgot that that picture existed. His voice, his voice, he had such a great voice. Mm -hmm. he, um, he loved the way he walked down the street and just sauntered with his hands in his pocket and he just talked with such a gravelly, sexy voice that I, I don't even understand where that came from, except the 3,000 cigarettes he smoked a week. <laughs> um, so I, I just loved his swagger. Mm. That I loved. I knew, I know about him, but I don't remember the swagger. So seeing the film and seeing that again mm. brought him back. And there were some interesting things in the film that I hadn't known before I watched it, many actually. And, and one of them was when former State Assembly Speaker and former San Francisco Mayor Willie Brown talked about how he met George Moscone. They met when they both worked as janitors at, at the UC, at UC Hastings um, College of Law. What are some other interesting tidbits that are very little known that you think the public should know about George Moscone? Well, it, it's hinted at because it wasn't a point of emphasis in the program, but I, I became fascinated by how he could be someone who crossed the aisle. And in the context of current politics, a man who had friends in the Republican Party who can make deals, mm -hmm. who got Ronald Reagan, the governor, to sign an awful lot of bills that were passed by the legislature in those years. Mm -hmm. It showed a degree of sophistication and honor. And we had some footage that isn't all in there, but right. there's a little bit from former um, Governor George Duke Majin that talks about how um, they got together, even when they were on opposite sides of things. It's a wonderful film. He knew how to work together with people. And we want to say that Moscone, A Legacy of Change, the documentary will air uh, next Friday at 8 p.m. right here on KQED. And in the meantime, Jonathan Moscone and Matt Katzman, thanks to you both. Thank you. Thank you. And that will do it for us. Next week, we hope you'll tune in for a KQED Newsroom special featuring interviews with dynamic, provocative authors. As always, you can find more of our coverage at kqed.org slash newsroom. I'm Tui Vu. Thank you for joining us and have a wonderful Thanksgiving. <laughs>